Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me if I don't stand behind the podium? Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm so pleased to be here. When Shin called me, I said, I am going to visit BC. And besides, I'm an old friend of Dr. Presley, your VP for Student Affairs. We, we both came from Colorado. And thank you, Scott, and all the other students who helped bring me here. If you can't hear me, just raise your hands in the back, OK? Buenas noches a todos los compañeros y compañeras de América Latina. I call myself a multicultural person because of circumstances of my life. Having been a refugee twice before I was 12, I'm probably a little bit older than I look. And I've also had the privilege of attending some of the finest universities in the United States, just like BC. And one of the reasons for attending an elite university is precisely because of the privilege and the opportunities that schools like BC offer. So for example, the students that I had dinner with tonight were telling me about their plans to study abroad. That's how I became engaged with Latin America, because a school like Stanford was very actively involved with sending students to study abroad. So I studied in Germany. I went to Israel, working at kibbutz, and um, went to Peru and Brazil, and I have not stopped since. And in the process of learning by experiencing and traveling, as well as the normal ways of learning through books and research, I have found myself increasingly thinking about global connections. So when Shen asked me, what do you want to talk about? I said, let me talk about globalization and Asian Americans and try to use that broad theme to make all kinds of connections. And I'm going to just throw out a few things and I hope that we will have time to have a discussion. But let me just start by asking you, what does globalization mean? Just tell me a few. What is globalization? Term you use all the time, yes. International trade. International trade, certainly, yes. Inter interconnections between peoples and? And inter, okay, across borders, shall we say, right? Anything else? Yes? Making the world smaller because of all these connections. No? Now, how old is this thing called globalization? Is there something new? Is there something recent? You're not sure? No? Sometimes when we talk about globalization, we think it just it's a recent phenomenon, but think about it. Think about it. Who was Alexander the Great? What was he doing? Hmm? I thought he was pretty much moving across the globe and the world as he knew it, right? What about someone like Genghis Khan? There's a new book about Genghis Khan, by the way. <coughs> moving across the world, and that was the ancient world, right? What about the Silk Road? Have you heard of the Silk Road? Hmm? That's an international trading system, wasn't it? The Silk Road, huh? So there was globalization, I think, from a long time ago. But if we limit ourselves to what we call the modern era, what, what do you think, perhaps, we could cite as the first modern movement towards world integration and globalization that includes the idea of trade, of interconnections, and some of the other things that I'm going to introduce very quickly. Who? Communication. Communication, yes. But name one specific historical event. Yes. Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution. When, approximately when? I'm sorry? 1910. 1910. OK. I'm thinking of a few centuries before that. I'm thinking of a few centuries before that. Come on. When we talk about American history, you know, we say, and, and actually the day we celebrate is coming up next week in October. Huh? What is that date? Come on. Columbus. Did somebody say Columbus? 1492. Now remember the topic tonight, ostensibly, is globalization and Asian Americans. Where was Columbus heading? 
well, he called it Las Indias, no? The Indies, which was Asia, right? And the first people he met on his way, what did he name them? Indians, because he was convinced he arrived at where he planned to arrive. Although we now know that his knowledge of geography was very poor, no? <laughs> so imagine the sigh of relief in Asia when Columbus got lost on the way and didn't get there. See? And raised havoc elsewhere in another part of the world that we call America. But I make that point to say that globalization and Asia began with, in the modern era, with Christopher Columbus. Let's not forget, he was trying to reach Asia. And why did he want to reach Asia? This Italian, in the service of the Spanish crown, which had unified under Ferdinand and Isabel, kicked out the Moors, created a country that we call Spain, right there on the Mediterranean, tapping into the already vibrant Mediterranean world. What was Columbus interested in? Trade. Did somebody say trade earlier, right? Trade. Because they had things they wanted to sell and things they wanted to buy. Okay. Now, along the way, Columbus and then the Spaniards who sponsored his trips quote, discovered America. We could also say that in discovering America for Europe, they also invented America. No, they had to invent America, right? Because the peoples who lived in this land called America were already there, and they had many different kinds of names for themselves. They were certainly not called Indians, and they were not called Americans either. Hmm? Anyway, trade was foremost in their minds. But as you know, in order to trade, you have to have something to trade with and something to trade for. No? What did these Europeans want from Asia and later on from America? What did they want? You know that, spices, right? Then they discovered other kinds of natural resources. In the case of the Americas, of Mexico and Peru, particularly what we now call Bolivia, Potosi, no? what did they want? Or later on in the 19th century, California, as the empires grew and expanded, what did they want from the Americas that they used to trade? Gold, silver, no? what else? They also created, cultivated materials for trade. Tobacco, cotton, no? And how did they produce these products? On large scale, economic systems called plantations, right? And in order to produce such things, they needed labor. Think about it. No, they needed labor. Well, they could exploit the local labor, which they did. They didn't figure, however, on the local people dying so fast. Right? We know that there were serious epidemics because the Native Americans were not used, having had no previous contact, were not used to the diseases and the viruses that were brought over. And they died very rapidly. Besides, being on their own land, they didn't take very well to being subjugated and forced to work under harsh conditions of the plantation. So what was the solution? Whether it was mines, in some cases, or plantations, in other cases. This is another step in globalization, another theme which nobody has mentioned, but I'm sure you all know. Hmm? Slavery or labor, right? Globalization. Another big theme of globalization, you all thought about trade and commerce, but don't forget labor, right? Labor is another flow or movement that links the world together. The movement of people for labor, that began right with Columbus, no? First with labor from Africa, massively so. Massive, we're talking about 
25 million maybe of people taken out of Africa and distributed all across the Americas. Now, let's continue this linkage of globalization with Asia. What did these Europeans desire from Asia, and how did they finally make a continuous link with Asia? First for trade, and later on for labor as well. Remember, Columbus lost his way, right? He never got to Asia, we know that. He went back to Spain, although he swore to his dying day that he had reached Las Indias. Why? Because the only way he could collect on the prize money was to have reached his goal. He was not stupid. He insisted he had reached Asia, even though I think he knew he didn't. But the point is, those Europeans who came after Columbus figured out that this new land stood between Europe and Asia. And they soon discovered another great ocean that they call the Mar del Sur, or the Southern Ocean, which is what today we call it what? What is that great ocean that lies between America and Asia? The Pacific, right? These Europeans had known a lot about the Atlantic Ocean. They thought there was only one body of water. <coughs> now they found out from the native peoples in what is now present-day Panama that there is another great even bigger body of water called the Pacific Ocean. And so what did the Europeans do? What did the Spaniards do? Using Mexico, the port of Acapulco, as the entrepot, the midpoint. They established a long-distance global trading system that lasted for three centuries with an archipelago that they named after their king, Philip. And what are we talking about? all you Filipinos and Filipinas, hmm? Manila, no? Luzon, the Philippines, Las Filipinas. And what do we call this international trading system that linked Asia to America, to Europe? The Manila Galleon trade. The Manila Galleon trade. Okay, the ships would arrive from Europe to Mexico, they would land on the Atlantic side in Veracruz. They would go by land to the Pacific side called Acapulco. Today, you think Acapulco is some rich people's playground, right? But it used to be, and it still is, a very good natural port, deep water. And then they would go from Acapulco to Manila, which the Spaniards colonized, right? Extended their empire far out into the Pacific and colonized it. And who, was, who were going to Manila to trade with the Spaniards? The Chinese, the Japanese, and actually the Dutch and the Portuguese were there as well. It was a very cosmopolitan place from the 16th, 17th, and all the way into the 18th and early 19th century. Can you imagine what the Philippines was like then? One of the most cosmopolitan places. So all these Asian societies, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Filipinos themselves, sold their goods and wares to the Europeans who gathered there. Now, what did the Spanish use to buy these wonderful Asian goods? Hmm? What did they extract from Mexico and from Peru, or Bolivia, more accurately? Huh? Silver. Silver. They used the silver from the Americas to buy these products from Asia. And then they transshipped these products through the Americas back to Europe. Am I painting a clear enough picture for you of globalization happening centuries ago? Now, I want to tell you something. Even though their primary interest was trade, Inevitably, people also moved back and forth because people had to man the ships, right? And guess what sailors like to do then as now? What do sailors like to do? <laughs> Come on. They like to jump ship, right? 
Isn't that true? If they say, oh, I don't want this job anymore, or this is really boring, or this is really hard work, they jump ship, right? And so we have sailors jumping ship all over the Americas. And if you are on the lamb, running from the law, just like slaves do, what do you do? You try to hide out a bit? No. You want to create communities maybe a little bit away from the center of attention? But the point I want to make is that people from Asia came to the Americas with these Manila ships a long time ago, before California, before the 19th century. How do we know that? Because we have documents. I have a wonderful document dated 1635. That's a long time ago. And it is a petition by a group of Spanish barbers in Mexico City to the viceroy, who was the highest colonial official in Mexico, then called New Spain. And this is what that petition said. It said, there's a group of Chinese barbers here in Mexico City, and they work all the time. They never close up shop. They even work on Sundays when the rest of us are at church and spending time with our families. We want you, meaning the viceroy, to forbid them to do business in downtown Mexico City. We want you to send these Chinese barbers to the outskirts of town. 1634. Already we are seeing racial tension and competition. This kind of competition at the base of so much of our racial tensions today. We saw it first, way back then in the 17th century. Okay. So that's one theme I want to tell you, that this kind of exchange of people also came along with the exchange of goods and commerce. Let me make another connection for you in the Americas with globalization and Asia and Asian Americans, meaning Asians in the Americas. We talked about slavery, right? Tens of millions of peoples from Africa, from many different parts of Africa and many different ethnic groups in Africa, brought over and distributed all over the Americas. And that system of labor lasted for hundreds of years. But by the beginning of the 19th century, there was a lot of pressure to end that system of labor. And effectively, it began to diminish. Political pressure, economic pressure. But in some places, notably a place called Cuba and a place called Peru, plantations still flourished while the supply of African labor, slaves, was becoming increasingly difficult and increasingly expensive because the British were blockading the slave trade in the Caribbean, making it difficult for the plantation owners of Cuba to continue to replenish their slave supply. So where do you think those slave masters and plantation owners turned to get supplementary labor. Asia. Remember, this is a story about globalization and Asia with two sub-themes, trade and commerce and labor. This next brief story I'm going to tell you caps, puts all these themes together. When the plantation owners needed more labor, cheap labor, and couldn't get enough of it from Africa, they turned to Asia, specifically to China, and they brought slaves over, except they were not called slaves, they were called coolies, or contract laborers under eight-year contracts. And then the British said, hey, it's too much trouble to go to China because we don't control the government of China. We know another source of cheap labor, and it's called India because India belongs to us. So the British started another semi-slave trade from India, also called coolies. Now, if you know anything about the Caribbean today, you know that the Caribbean is a multiracial society, right? All of the Caribbean countries. And what are the major racial ethnic groups? Very few whites, actually. You know, when they lost the colonies, when they lost the plantations, they all went back home, most of them. But what's left in these Caribbean societies? 
of course, the descendants of slaves, right? But who else is left? Anybody here from Jamaica? Anybody been to Trinidad? Has anybody been to Guyana? Right? There you can see the descendants of the Asian contract laborers or coolies, right? The Chinese, the Indians, as well as the Africans, right? And a, sm and a small number of white people, too. Some of them did stay. But they are all mixed. They are all mixed. Go to the Caribbean if you've not been there. And when you go there for the first time, keep your eyes wide open because you will see things that you don't see anywhere else in the world. I'm going to show you some things in a while. And the same thing in the United States, of course, right? The United States had to bring over Asian labor when we, quote, open up the American West. When, when did we start opening the American West? You know, California, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho. Hmm? When did that happen? About the middle of the 19th century, right? About the middle of the 19th century. And the question of labor came up again. Who are we going to get to build the railroads, to work in the mines, to do all this dirty, lousy, you know, undesirable work, then we're not going to pay them very much, so we don't know, we don't think white people would like this job very much, right? Although there were white immigrants actually doing a lot of them, they're called Irish. Anybody who's Irish out here? There must be a lot of Irish here at BC. <laughs> I know most of you here don't look Irish, a few of you, right? So the Irish came, didn't they? They came in dirt poor, despised by the British, racialized, you know? And they did a lot of the dirty work right here in this region of the country. But when they started building the railroads out west, as the Chinese were building the railroads towards the east, the Irish figured out, hey, if we learn to out-racist the white people already here, we will get an entry into being white as well. And so they took on the Chinese and they enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act. But that was after the Chinese were already brought over across the Pacific, later on the Japanese, and other groups from Asia to do what? Build the railroads, work the mines, open the land for agriculture. And when the Chinese came and opened up the land and worked the mines, whose land and whose Territory did they inevitably encroach upon, just like anybody who was in the West at the same time. The native peoples, right? The native peoples, that was inevitable. But here's the important thing to remember. Those who opened up the American West for globalization, for trade, for commerce, for export of these goods, that California produced, that the West produced, wanted to, but found it impossible to introduce the labor system then prominent in the American South, that is slavery. So that the introduction of Asian labor followed the decline of slavery in the Americas. So one system, one global system of labor in the Americas gave way to another global system of labor. Do you see how these different globalizations are actually interconnected in that way as well? Now, in the case of Cuba, let me tell you very briefly, and I don't have time to talk about it today. If you're interested, I will give you my email and I'll send you my articles on this. Very interesting thing happened. Chinese contract laborers worked alongside African slaves on the same plantations. And they had to learn to coexist in a system controlled by white plantation owners and major domos who used very effectively most of the time a divide and conquer method. But guess what? Because both the African slaves and the Chinese coolies wanted freedom, they learned that they had a common interest, which is to free themselves from the plantation system 
of unfree labor, and they came together. It's a wonderful instance of two groups that we often seem to think are somehow inherently locked against each other, found common ground in the case of Cuba, and fought for freedom together. No? I'll tell you a little bit about that later. I have something to show you. It's one of the byproducts of this type of globalization. Well, anyway, let me just conclude by showing you through a series of illustrations some of the themes of globalization. And my point to you about naming this lecture tonight Globalization and Asians or Asian Americans or Asians in America is to move a group called Asians, oftentimes on the margins of American history and world history, to the center. I want to make a point that Asians are both agents, the drivers and the movers and shakers of something called globalization, as well as the subjects and the objects of globalization that is moved by others in their scheme of mobilization. So that when I look at world history, I really do see Asians everywhere. You know, there's something about scholarship and learning and knowledge. If you don't look for it, just like everything else, you won't find it. But if you ask the right question and you look for it, you will see it. Because I knew that there are Koreans in Latin America, I quickly identified three of your schoolmates up there who are Koreans from Venezuela and from Argentina. Right? Yes. Took me one second to identify, one second. All I needed to know was one tiny bit of information, I figured it out. Why? Because I know that there are Koreans in that part of South America, right? So I was looking for it. Before I came to BC, I said, I am sure I'm going to find some Asians here at BC who will speak Spanish. And I was correct, see? Because I know enough about globalization and Asians to know that I'm likely to run into Asians from Latin America. Hmm? Now, if you look for this, you will see what I see as well, that Asians are very much in the center of the history of globalization for the past 500 years. And not only are we not marginal to the story, we are central to the story, okay? In so many multiple and various ways, that it really boggles your mind because the stories are un unending. So let me just, as I say, use illustrations to quickly go through some of these stories. Now, I call him our favorite Asian American. Who is this? <laughs> Come on. Tiger, but you know, he's Asian American, right? He's our favorite Asian American. He is a product of the meeting of Asia and America. His mother is of what ethnic background? She's Thai, and his father is African-American, who says he also has some Chinese blood in him and some Native American, like many peoples of African descent in America, right? Now, because his father, this is another theme of globalization, which is war, because his father was in the US military that was sent to Asia, he met his mother in Thailand, right? And they were married. So Tiger is a product of globalization. No? <laughs> you see? But he is our favorite Asian. And as I said, another theme is war. Look at this. War, we talked about labor, we talked about commerce, we talked about war. These are the, according to the U.S. government, these are all the different Asian groups now in America that is counted by the U.S. Census. Okay? We can identify many of these groups, and these groups down here, particularly the Laotian, Cambodia, Hmong, and Vietnamese. Why are they here for the most part, these refugee groups? Because of war, right? Because of war. You see? So war also produces globalization. War is globalization, right? And in the past half century, from the Korean War on, hmm? from the Korean War on, and of course, even before that, the Filipinos. 
All of them were involved with U.S. military encroachment in Asia in the 20th and 21st century. And that's one key reason why they are here in America. Okay. Other groups, Chinese, Japanese, we could say they came because of the labor demands. Hmm? No? But some of these groups are here because of war. Who's this? Come on, who is this? He's just the tallest NBA player. You know the NBA is in trouble when the tallest player is an Asian guy, right? <laughs> He's a product of globalization. What kind of globalization are we talking about? The global marketing of the NBA. You see, the NBA cannot continue to expand if it does not market the game to Asia. Not that Yao Ming is not a good player. He is a good player. But every time he plays, his game is beamed across to Asia, and particularly to China. And how many people tune in? About a billion people, right? About a quarter of the world, you see? How many of you have even checked into the Yao Ming websites in Chinese? It's amazing. It's amazing, right? Another globalization in the 21st century, no? Isn't that true? Yao Ming is so popular in China, right? Oh, I got a couple more for you. Who's this? I happen to be an NFL fan. Who's this? Are you Vietnamese American? Yeah? You're Japanese. Who's Vietnamese here? Okay, who's this? Oh, come on. You don't know! Oh! <laughs> this is the NFL lineman for the... That win for what team? Oh, which team? Dallas Cowboys, man. He's a starter. He is a starter, and he's that win. And who is this? Come on, all you Filipinos. Come on. Benny, Benny, Akbayana, who played for the Mets. I don't know if he still plays for the Mets because they trade them up so fast, right? That's Benny, right? And what about Ichiro? Hmm? Who's this? Corazon Aquino, ex-president of the Philippines. Where was she educated? In New York, in Manhattan College. You know, in the U.S., right? Globalization. Ah, bet you don't know who she is unless you're Canadian. Any Canadian here? No Canadians here? Oh, come on. Who is this? Come on. Oh. <laughs> and he's Canadian Asian, too. Are you Japanese? Chinese? Oh, you got to know. Where, where's your hometown in Canada? Vancouver? <laughs> Say it again, I didn't hear. Toronto. Oh, you got to know her. Her name is Adrian Clarkson. Adrian Pond Clarkson. Who is Adrian Pond Clarkson? Chinese immigrant to Canada who is now the Governor General of Canada. You know what the Governor General is? It's the highest honorific position. She represents the Queen of England in the former colony called Canada. She is the face of Canada as far as the Queen of England is concerned, and she is a product of globalization. No? This is one of my very favorites. Okay, you South Asians, who's this? Oh, there was a South Asian here, she left. Okay, <laughs> who's this? Sonia Gandhi. Sonia Gandhi, who married Rajiv Gandhi, who's the son of Indira Gandhi, who's a longtime premier of, prime minister of England, I mean, of England, of India. And what, where was she born? Italy. Italy, thank you. Right? Another phase of globalization. Okay, you see, I knew I'm gonna see a lot of Filipinos today. So, all you Filipinos, who's this? Yes, General Taguba! <laughs> Come on, he is my hero. Why is he so important? Actually, he's Major General. I'm, we, let's not promote him too fast. What did he investigate? The, tor the prison torture, Abu Ghraib, right? Probably still wrote the best report on the damn thing. And, and this is 
a Filipino. Why are there Filipinos serving in the US military? Globalization, right? Because after the Spaniards left the Philippines, the Philippines had that much time for independence, and then what happened? The Americans said, uh-uh, not so fast, and came and recolonized the Philippines, right? OK? So you see a lot of Filipinos in the US military, no? Because of that history of globalization. One of my favorites, who's this? Very important guy. Anybody from the west coast of the United States? Anybody from Seattle? No? From the state of Washington, Oregon? Gary Locke. Gary Locke, thank you. Who's Gary Locke? He still is, but he's finishing up his second term. Governor of the state of Washington. The only Asian American to be governor outside of Hawaii, right? Son of Chinese immigrants brought over to work. His dad owned a laundry, like all of the Chinese at that time. No, but Gary went to Yale Law School, became a successful politician. Another product of globalization. Now this, I don't expect you to know unless you're from San Francisco, but I find her very important. She is Kamala. Who is Kamala? San Francisco's first Asian Pacific American, African American, and woman district attorney. <laughs> She's mixed. She's half African American and half Asian American, and she's the first woman as well in that Pacific hub called San Francisco, no? So I think Kamala is another good face of globalization. Taiwanese daughter came over when she was four years old. Who is this? From parents from Taiwan? Elaine Chow. Who's Elaine Chow? U.S. Secretary of Labor in George Bush's cabinet. Hmm? Elaine Chow. Okay, this is good. Now, all of you Latinos don't say anything. Let's see if the rest of the people know. Who's this? Hey, who said that? No, you said it. You're not supposed to. <laughs> she couldn't help herself. Okay, Alberto. If we say it in Spanish, you wouldn't say Fujimori. If we give it a good Spanish pronunciation, that J is soft to it's what? Fujimori, no? Alberto Fujimori. No? Alberto Fujimori. Do you know who he is? Who is he? He was the president of Peru. Per president of Peru. Two term president of Peru. Son of Japanese immigrants. And where is he hiding now? Where is he now? Back in Japan. Back in Japan because the Peruvian government wants to bring him to trial for corruption. And he's hiding back in Japan, which has no extradition treaties. Japan is protecting him. Why? Because he said he's a native son, even though he wasn't born here. But our citizenship law says that if his parents registered him in the village, he is Japanese. Another interesting example of globalization. Now, let me ask you. He is or was the president of a South American Spanish-speaking country called Peru. So clearly, he's Latino, right? If he, if he immigrates to New York or to Boston, what would he be his ethnic group or his ethnic identity? See? It's a little, a little hard, no? He's Latino, but of Asian descent. Or he's an Asian Latino. How about that? No? Anyway, Alberto Fujimori. Now, this is for Shin. Chen, because she's going to Denmark. Who is she? She's Princess Alexandra of Denmark, who is Chinese Hapa, mixed, half Chinese. Married the Prince of Denmark. They met in Hong Kong, and now she is a princess. So when you go to Denmark to study, they are used to seeing Chinese in Denmark because their princess is Chinese. That's globalization. Here are some more faces of globalization that I think you need to know. This young woman, 
Her name is Monique Trong, T-R-U-O-N-G. She won a major writing award recently called the Young Writers Award. Young Writers Award for the most outstanding American writer. She happens to be of Vietnamese descent who came over because of the war. And the book she wrote is called The Book of Salt, S-A-L-T, about the Vietnamese cook for Gertrude Stein. No? She imagined what life must have been like, because there's very little known about this Vietnamese cook. OK, now, remember I told you about Cuba. Perhaps Cuba's most renowned artist. And if you want to see his art, you can go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York or go to the Studio Museum of Harlem. And you will find Cuba's, Cuba's most famous artist whose theme is Afro-Cubanidad. And his name is Wilfredo Lam, L-A-M. Wilfredo Lam's father was a Chinese and mother was Afro-Cuban. And he grew up in a plantation in the middle of Cuba. And he became a world-renowned artist he hung out with Picasso, you know, in Paris, right? And there is now in Havana, Cuba, a museum dedicated just to his work, just to his work. Oh. So I want to just show you, for example, this is one of the paintings that's now in Cuba. You can see, you know, you, know, you can see the Picasso type modernist expressionist art, no? But this is Wilfredo Lam. Anyway, those are some of the examples of um, Asians in America who are products of globalization. I have just happened to have these figures, just to give you an idea of how one group of Asians over the course of the last 300 years spread themselves all over the world. Now, we can find similar patterns for other groups, but perhaps none so dramatic as the Chinese. You know, we know there are a lot of Chinese in the world, right? I mean, back in China, right? Something like 1.25 billion. But how many of you realize that 55 million Chinese live outside of China because of globalization? 55 million, that is a lot, right? They're all over the world. This is a most, perhaps single most phenomenal distribution. Now, going back a little bit in history, I want to trace for you what happens to this history. When the Chinese first came over, you know, what did we see the mess? Remember I told you they came to supplement labor on the plantations, right? This plantation happened to be in Louisiana. Now, how many of you know that there were Chinese workers in Louisiana? Bet you didn't know that, right? Did you know that? Yes. Yeah. Pardon me? Oh, you're from there. Now, isn't that a little bit of hidden history that we don't talk about? Now, let me ask you the next question. Where did these Chinese come from? Those who went to Louisiana. Huh? Think of the location of Louisiana. It's on the Gulf of Mexico. So there's Louisiana up there. And there's the Gulf. That's right, from Cuba. See? There was a moment about 1860s when the Louisiana plantations also experienced a shortage of labor, and guess what? They called their buddies up in Cuba and say, hey, you know those Chinese workers you have on your plantations? How's about sending us a few? Because we need some. So they send them up, you see? There was always communication and traffic between Cuba and Louisiana. So that's another example of the interconnections through globalization, okay? Now, what happens though when there are too many of them? We call them what? What are these depictions of? When there are too many of them, we call them locusts or a yellow peril, right? Too many of them. They come and they eat up Uncle Sam's farm. And not only that, when a Chinese worker comes and works so hard, he was not favorably de depicted. No, here's a hard-working coolie or hard-working 
Chinaman, as we say. But look at his eyes, look at that greed, and what is he doing with his earnings? That's another example of globalization. When the Filipinos today go out in the millions to work outside of the Philippines, when the Mexicans come across the border to work in the U.S., what are they doing it for? Is it because they love to come over and work in those poultry plants and work as maids for people, work in the sex industry? No. They work so that they can support their families back home, right? What do we call it when you send the money back home? Remittances. Somebody was telling me. Was it you, Andrew, or somebody was telling me how many billions sent back? 60 billion sent back to the Philippines. 60 billion. How much sent back to the Mexi to, from the U.S. by the Mexican workers? Several tens of billions as well. No? So the Chinese were doing that as well. That's another example of globalization. Globalization also means the flow of capital back and forth, right? The earnings go back to support the family and to sustain the economies. But they didn't like it in the 19th century when the Chinese were doing that, working three jobs at a time. Why? Because of American racism. The Chinese were blamed for, this is 19th century, not 21st century, but it sounds awfully like the kind of arguments we still hear today. When immigrant workers work too hard, we say what? They take jobs away from whom? From nice Americans, right? Look at these nice American boys sitting idly by. And what is this here? <laughs> it says penitentiary. So now immigrant labor also contribute to crime in America. You see? The connection was made in the 19th century. Hmm? I love this cartoon because it tells us so much about this country's benefiting from globalization on the one hand and feeling very ambivalent about it on the other hand. Another aspect of globalization, contradictions or contradictory feelings, no? A nation of immigrants, which is what we say we are, with recurrent anti-immigrant movements that we call in history books nativism. It seems so irrational. It seems so puzzling. How can we, as a country of immigrants, also hate immigrants? That's what we are, right? And that, I think, is because of globalization. Hmm? Today, we are seeing the same story played out again, except what word do we call it? Outsourcing, right? Well, it's the same story, isn't it? I'm going to talk, before I let you guys go, I want to talk a little bit about that, but let me finish this story first. So we have these Chinese who came over and built the railroads. This was a beautiful 19th century photojournalist. You know the panorama, right, of just shooting down the railroad. We know these are Chinese workers because of their conical hats, no? Working very hard, building this railroad. And yet, when the history was recorded, when the railroad was connected with Irish workers building it from east to west, with Chinese workers building it from west to east, meeting in Utah, a photograph was staged to commemorate the moment for history, for posterity, and Irish workers were there, the tycoons were there, but every single Chinese worker was, say, was kept out of the photo and said, you are not going to be in this photograph, and therefore you are not going to be in this history. That's also globalization. Who's in, who's out, right? Who called the shots? Hmm? Look at this picture, you see? So, how do we feel about the Asians today? Remember the theme? Globalization and Asians in America. Can you recognize these faces, huh? Hillary, Bill, Al, no? This is at the height of the Clinton years when the Republicans and those people who just couldn't stand the Clintons drew up this cartoon in the right-wing uh, journal called National Review. And look, at the, look how they chose to depict them in these Asian images. No? Right? So America, always very ambivalent. How ambivalent? Well, in recent years, on the one hand, they say, 
You Asian immigrants, because the Asian immigrants were shut out of America. Remember that long list of names? Okay, before 1965, all the Asians in America were only Chinese, Japanese, and a few Koreans, and a few Punjabis from India. That's it. After 65, with the changes of the immigration law, so many more Asians came, and not only many in terms of numbers, but origins from all over Asia, Thai, Indonesian, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, South Asian, you name it. No, we have them, right? And they came from everywhere, and the numbers have increased so significantly. From under 1 million in 1965 to now over 10 million. The fastest growth rate of any group in America. So we call these Asians who are self-selected for what since 65? For your parents' educational background, right? For your middle class status. It's a selected group. They came over to America. And let's make the connection with the Civil Rights Movement. They came just when the Civil Rights Act was passed. That's how I came. I, my timing was really good because I came and immediately I was slotted into a new social policy to advance minorities in America called affirmative action. And I was admitted to Stanford as an affirmative action admin because quickly they opened the umbrella to embrace what? All minority groups and all women, right? So I was a double whammy, you know. <laughs> I was a twofer, you see? And as an Asian immigrant, I was immediately embraced by affirmative action, and the Stanford admissions officer told me, you are an affirmative action admit. Why? Because your SAT verbal score was way too low for Stanford, but we like the fact that you work hard, you're a striver, your counselors wrote you good letters, and all those good things we do under affirmative action. We're going to give you a chance. And I graduated top of my class because I didn't want to embarrass my teachers, right? Let alone my parents. Now, <laughs> I want to tell you the story, though. Because that same year, a young man who graduated from Phillips Andover, you know that school here, right? Went to Yale. Son of Yaleys, grandson of Yaleys. He had a C average from high school, but he got into Yale, and he graduated with a C average. And now, of course, he's president of the United States. <laughs> That's not the story. The story is, oh, you know, I told you about my low SAT scores, right? <laughs> no? <laughs> Would you, somebody ask me how low was my SAT score? Please ask me that. How low, how low was it? It was 611. Now, when this young man ran for president of the United States, somebody leaked his admissions record, and it was published in the New Yorker magazine. Remember my SAT score, right? 611. His SAT score was 566. Much lower than mine. But nobody had to tell him they had to lower the bar for him and bend the rules, right? So, I'm telling you too, that story. <laughs> Globalization, you see, because my timing was very good. I came to the United States right at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, which opened all kinds of doors for me because I represented an underrepresented group at that time. Eventually, our success gave us a name of what? The model minority in America, right? That we are super minority, we're so much better than other minorities, we're so much smarter, we don't do so well. But wait, I'm going to tell you another part of globalization. Who's this guy? Dr. Wen Ho Lee. What did the guy do, this nerdy scientist from Los Alamos? <laughs> Minding his own business, going fishing on weekends, very boring guy. What did he do? <laughs> he was accused of selling nu of nuclear secrets to China. After one year in solitary confinement and his legs in chains, what happened to those 79 charges? All of them dropped but one, a very minor one. All right, so he, he, he was not a good spy. So we found a better spy. <laughs> this one is better, Anita Leung. Now these are all Asian immigrants to America. Anita Leung from LA. You see, because we figured it doesn't make for a good spy story if there's no sex and no money. 
So we found one with sex and money. <laughs> she was accused of sleeping with two FBI agents, the officer in charge of San Francisco and the officer in charge of LA. And for good measure, one was white and one was black. <laughs> and she was charged with collecting two million bucks from the Chinese government for supposedly when she's sleeping with these agents, she would look into their briefcase and steal the documents and Xerox, she had a home Xerox machine. <laughs> Xerox them and send them on to the US government. She wasn't even charged with anything after the story leaked, right? But it sure was a lot sexier, the story. <laughs> Finally, this is very sad. I mean, we're making light of this. Who is this? West Point graduate, right? Captain James E. But his crime was that he converted to Islam, and then he was called by the US government to go to Guantanamo Bay to be an Islamic chaplain for the 600 plus prisoners we put in that little place in Cuba. And he too was accused of spying. What happened to all his charges? After six months of imprisonment, all dropped, all dropped. Now I point these out because this is the situation with Asians in America. Another contradiction. On the one hand, lauded for being a model minority. On the other hand, constantly reminded that you're still a perpetual foreigner, never to be trusted entirely. And the minute you become too secure, we're going to remind you, don't feel secure in America. Right? These two stories, side by side coexisting. Why is that? Because of America's discomfort about Asia itself. No? What particular countries in Asia make the United States very nervous? China? Japan? Huh? Korea? Indonesia, because it has the largest Muslim population, right? Yes? India, come on, you add India to China, you got half the world's population and they are not even Christians and they're not white. <laughs> no, seriously, you see, India, Japan, Japan because it is an Asian country that is part of the G7, no, the top economic powers of the world, you see. And why is that a problem? Because Japan, at one time, it was thought could buy up America. And what did Japan buy? Bought Rockefeller Center. Sony Studio. Pardon me? Sony Studio. Sony Studio. It bought the Hollywood, right? And then, of course, all our homes are filled with Sony and Panasonic and Mitsubishi, and we only drive Japanese cars. Was that not scary for America? But that's globalization, because globalization is what? World trade? And in the name of the game, whoever trades the best, sells the lowest, gets the price. But when the tables are turned on us, we're not very comfortable about it under globalization, are we? You see? So the last stage of globalization I'm going to talk about and I'm going to make you uncomfortable. Because today, of course, it is undeniable that these Asian countries are world economic powers. Not only do they have a lot of the world's population, half or more, actually more than half of the world's population lives in Asia, right? A lot of the world economic power is in Asia, no? Not just the big ones like China and Japan, but little tiny ones, we call them what? Little tigers. You know, there's the big tigers and the little tigers. What are the little tigers called? Taiwan, Singapore, and until recently, Hong Kong, although now Hong Kong is part of China officially, right? But these little tigers are very powerful economically. And what do these little tigers do? Not only around the Pacific Rim, and when you think of the Pacific Rim, it's a huge area of the world, right? What is the Pacific Rim? Asia itself, extending all across the Pacific to Australia and New Zealand, which now have cast their lot, economically speaking, with the Asia Pacific. 
you know, finally, the Australians and New Zealanders, even though they're white settler society, says we may be white, but our fate, our future lies with the Asians in the Asia Pacific. And we better stop thinking of ourselves as Europeans, no? So the Asia Pacific, and then all the way across to this side of the Pacific to what? To California, Washington, Vancouver. That whole Pacific face of the United States. All the way down to Central America, South America, Brazil, Peru, you name it. That's the Asia Pacific, or the Pacific Rim, right? And across the Pacific Rim, what we see floating back and forth in multiple ways is Asian capital, Asian capital. That's another big theme of globalization, particularly in the present age, is the flow of capital back and forth and around <coughs> and in many different directions. I want to show you a little bit about globalization today. Because one of the key aspects of globalization today, we mentioned the word outsourcing. Outsourcing means what? The way we produce goods today in the 20th, late 20th and now the 21st century, be it something small like a pair of athletic shoes or something enormous like a Boeing 777, the design is done in one place, the material, raw materials are obtained elsewhere, and the production, the manufacturing is sent to yet another place. And sometimes to manufacture a blouse, a shirt, a shoe, the same design using the same materials can be simultaneously manufactured in many different locations and sites around the world. For a very complex thing like a Boeing 777, this huge airplane, the production is fragmented, that is broken apart with different pieces sent to different sites and different factories and manufactured, and then they will come together and assembled into the final product. That's what's called globalization. Now, who does all these assembling or these manufacturing around the world, particularly around this thing that we call the Asia Pacific? These are the subcontractors. These are the subcontractors. They're the middle level, right? And the job of the subcontractor is to take the design, take the materials, outbid each other for the job, and then what do they do? They go find the cheapest labor they can find anywhere in the world. Because if they don't find the cheapest labor, they're not going to make a profit since they outbid everybody else for the job. You see? Now, predominantly and increasingly so, the subcontracting level that we call the outsourced level are Asians a lot of Asian capital. And because they are occupying that mid-level, these Asian subcontractors, whether they're operating on the U.S.-Mexican border like Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez, which is across from El Paso, Texas, whether they are down there in Central America or in the Caribbean, in the Dominican Republic, or all across Asia itself, what are they chasing, these subcontractors? They are chasing the cheapest labor around. And they are squeezing that labor because they are the ones that deal with direct labor relations. Relieving the big manufacturers, the big fancy labels, people like Donna Karen and Tommy Hilfiger says, we don't know anything about labor problems because we've outsourced them. We have subcontracted our labor. Go talk to these Koreans, these Taiwanese, these Hong Kongers, these Chinese. Talk to them because they're the ones who are hiring the laborers. The same thing happening in Los Angeles garment, I mean the uh, New York garment industry, in the Los Angeles garment industry as well. And when these assembly plants do not even abide by the lowest minimum standards of wage and con safety conditions, what do we call these assembly plants? sweatshops. And Asian capital is very much implicated in the sweatshops as the subcontractors. But let me ask you, who are the workers? Back to that first theme we talked about. Also Asian, but also Latino and Caribbean and other racialized minority groups around the globe. You see? 
Okay, so this is another phase of globalization that I want you to be aware of. So let me finish with these. Here is a, uh, just to show you, if you don't know what I mean, this is an electronics assembly plant, right? They make, these are the maquilas or the assembly plants at the U.S.-Mexican border that is closing up. Where are they going? They're going in search of cheap labor, so they go all the way down to the Yucatan. This is a Hong Kong-owned Monte Group maquiladora in the Yucatan because labor in the southern border of Mexico is cheaper now than in the northern border of Mexico since 30 years of outsourcing on the border has raised the standard of living for those people living in northern Mexico, and so they have outpriced themselves. So they have to move the jobs down south to the Yucatan, and what do they make jeans for? Eddie Bauer, The Gap, and Banana Republic. But this is a Hong Kong-owned subcontractor. Now, look at the workers. That's why they're cheap. This is a Mayan Indian still wearing her traditional costume working at a textile machine in the Yucatan, no? All right, what happens when workers just like such as these workers in the Dominican Republic and another Asian-owned assembly plant try to organize and unionize the workers? What happens to these assembly plants? They disappear the next day. That's another feature of these assembly plants, right? If there's labor problems, they just close up shop and move elsewhere, okay? So you have this sort of problem all over the place, no? Here's one, another group of Guatemalan women sewing at an Asian-owned um, factory in El Salvador. This is one owned called the Mandarin. It's also owned by Asian labor, okay? Now, what do the Mexican workers fear? What they fear is that they will lose their jobs to China's low-wage labor force. And actually, the Chinese labor force is not the cheapest because they found that it's even cheaper in a place called Burma or Myanmar, which is now the latest front for the, and even cheaper still in Cambodia. You see, you see these assembly plants popping up all over the place, wherever the cheapest labor can be found in the Asia Pacific predominantly, and the Pacific Rim predominantly. So I put this in because he is a typical Asian garment middleman or subcontractor. No? This is the kind of person who would own, whose capital is used to fuel this latest round of globalization. Now, Finally, we found that they're not, we're not just outsourcing manufacturing jobs anymore in the U.S. What other jobs are being outsourced the latest round? Hmm? Information jobs. You know, these days if you call 800 to book a ticket on an airline, or if you call the Dell's 800 <laughs> helpline, huh? who are you likely to get? Huh? Somebody in India. Maybe China. Okay, these women and this woman are answering 800 number phone calls. This particular story is really poignant because they're actually answering phone calls from welfare mothers, welfare recipients in the U.S., who are calling about their checks and are told these welfare recipients that you're only going to have three more months, four more months because a new welfare reform says you've got to go get a job. And yet the kind of job that they could conceivably do are being outsourced to this woman who is answering her question, pretending to speak with a southern accent because that is a readily identifiable American accent. No? And being very vague about where she is. Now, more recently, even higher level kind, as I said, the Dell helpline is now in India, no? Many other kinds of programming jobs are now outsourced. So these are information jobs, a Chicago-based company that does outsource legal work, legal work. Often, many times now, if you go to a doctor's office, and you know how the doctor scribbles, 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 you know, whatever's wrong with you? That is sent overnight 
by fiber optics to India where medical students who can read their lousy handwriting because they understand medicine will transcribe and send it back. No? This is legal work. A lot of your tax returns, U.S. tax returns are being prepared in India and in Mexico. Yeah, now there's a little bit of security to say, wow, what have they got? They got my tax information, my social security number. Hmm? One of the best stories I heard was a company that set up shop in Ghana, because Ghana used to be a, a, a British colony, so many of the educated people speak English, right? You, you, know, it, you have to outsource them to places where there's a good basis of English-speaking educated people. And what was being outsourced to this company? New York City parking tickets. They were sent overnight and written up, transcribed. And these young ladies said, we've never been to New York, but when we do go to New York, we will know where not to park. Because <laughs> they know all about the parking problems of New York. And so finally, this story ends this way. Globalization again. Who is looking for a job because he just lost his? An Asian immigrant, right? Who was brought here? Decided, I'm going to study computer science because there's a future in it. This is a warning to all of you computer nerds. <laughs> Believe me, jobs are disappearing faster than you think because anything that can be outsourced for cheaper will be outsourced. Hmm? A lot of jobs that we saw could not be outsourced because of technology. No. Can be outsourced and is being outsourced. That's also globalization and Asian capital, Asian labor, and the commerce and trade in Asian goods and services all wrapped into one. Think about it. And if you read the newspapers like I do, I got all of these stories from reading the Wall Street Journal, from reading the New York Times, and a smattering of other newspapers. It's all around us. You don't have to look very hard, again, if you are asking the question and you're looking for something called globalization and all the connections, you will find it just as easily as I have found them. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I turn this off. <laughs> How do I turn this off, Scott? Are there any questions and comments? And I, kept you all so long. Oh, thank you. Any questions or comments or other helpful suggestions or anything you've seen in globalization? And, uh, well, I hope it was interesting for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, oh, great. Yes. So no. first. Okay, Scott. Um, Right. Either by like sharing ideas and culture. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, my question for you is like, uh, what has been your response to fail, like fellow Asian Americans or uh, other people of color who, who are opposed to your work? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they question, they, they, they question the importance of all that you stand for. And, uh, you know, they say just blend in with white society, blend in with the status quo. Uh -huh. um, you know, other than just dismissing them as like, Self haters. Yeah. Or, yeah. Them off as, uh, like wounded soldiers, so to right. Speak. Uh, my question is uh, Is there anything you found that's mm -hmm. like for mm -hmm. to Did you all hear the good question? Well, I think, like many of you, I wasn't born an American. I became one. No? I think when you become a citizen of a country like America with all the promises it holds and all the ideals, we really take it very seriously. And we want it. We want the ideals to be applied thoroughly and equitably. And that's my motivation. Well, there's so many things I could have said about globalization as I look into it. For one thing, globalization obviously benefits a lot of people. But as one critic says, it doesn't lift all boats, it only lifts the yachts. In other words, the rich people benefit much more than the average. How do we know that? Because the numbers tell us that under globalization, the present era, 
the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. In other words, instead of closing the gap between the haves and the have-nots, we are widening the gap within the United States. At the same time, we are also widening the gap between nations. That is, the world has become a far less equitable place. No? Now, I ask you, most of us would think that is not a good way to go. That is, with growing gaps between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the privileged and the not privileged. And the United States, because it's a country that I have become a part of and in a very deliberate way, now those of us who become Americans choose to become Americans, it disturbs me that the United States represents, exemplifies both kinds of disparities. That is a growing gap between nations and the growing gap within itself. So that's what I would ask students to think about. That is, are we moving into a future, not just for us, but certainly for our own children? No? That is a good one. Are we putting, are we preparing a society for our children that we think will be better than the one we inherited if we don't think about these issues? And are we true to the ideal of this country if we only think selfishly and only of our own well-being? Because as I said, I was a beneficiary of something called affirmative action, no? which meant that I was given a truly privileged education in a very privileged space called Stanford University. And now I teach at a very privileged place called Brown University. That's just like all of you. You are going to a very privileged institution called Boston College. No? What are you gonna do with all this privilege? Accumulate more? so that you can get even farther ahead of everybody else? You see? Those are simple questions, and it seems to be, to me, so un-American not to worry about the rest of us who aren't yet where we are. I think that's un-American. Does anybody else want to add to that question? Yes, at me. Yes, please. Not no, but I know you have another question. Yeah. Well, when you asked your question, then I had to rethink my question. Mm. And I guess I was just, when you were talking about the future and the United States being headed and you were talking about current globalization, yeah. it first made me think if in the future, how will people sort of come together around That's right. sort of a common sense of community? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good question. I think that those of us who teach about race, you no, know, and racialization, knows that race is often used to divide people, and to use as a justification or rationalization for other forces, like economic forces that divide us. Now, I think that if we can strip away all the subterfuge and call race and other forms of discrimination that blind us to our commonalities. For example, in the United States, why, why is it so often the white working class that exemplifies, exhibits the most intense form of racism? I mentioned the Irish workers when they came, right? Because the workers and the white immigrant working class was led to believe that their real enemies, that the, those who stood in their way of their social mobility were black people in America, rather than the bosses who exploited them. In other words, in this country, we have used race very effectively to trump class and trump other kinds of commonalities. So I think that we need to find a way to, that's why I, I think those of us who teach race are so committed to teaching it, not because you know, there's some kind of inherent interest in something called race, but because we understand what race has been used for in this country, to blind us to our commonalities so that we can really build coalitions 
No. Look at the current political climate, if I may. It seems baffling to me that people don't seem to vote their interests. No? Why would somebody who is unemployed and poor want to vote to, to give this president another term, I ask, given his policies? Well, think about it. I think this president is very good at instilling a kind of fear among certain groups of white Americans in particular, using code words like what? Same-sex marriage, you know, abortion, whatever it is to what? To really say your world, as you know it, is being threatened by these other groups, no? Using a kind of social fear, and we all have those fears, that is the world as we know it is slipping away from us, no? Rather than to exercise leadership to say, change is inherent in society. No? And we should not be afraid to embrace change, because that's the nature of human existence. And that's why some people in this country are going to vote against their self-interest because they don't know their self-interest because they're blinded by other kinds of fears. That's the challenge, I think, you know, we face, don't you think? Because we have and should be able to identify a common interest. I just want to very quickly tell you about those Chinese and those black slaves, those Chinese coolies and those black slaves in Cuba who for 30 years, as they coexist in the plantations, fought each other, killed each other at each other's throat. But when they realize that together they need to fight for freedom in the form of independence from Spain, which upheld the plantation system, guess what? They banded together and fought together for Cuban independence and succeeded in doing so. That's why I love that story, because it shows me that two groups that seem always divided by race and by other, you know, kind of superficial differences, once they realize that they have the strong common interest, can put aside those differences and come together and fight for that common goal. And as I said, that's why I love history, because I look back to history to find these concrete examples to use, no? Any other questions or comments, or you're also tired out? Well, thank you very much, then. Thank you.